following interview was conducted with Thomas P. Adler, Professor Emeritus of English for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, July 16, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Good afternoon, Professor Adler. Thank you very much. Let's tell, tell me a little here. bit uh, about where you were born and early years growing up. Okay, I, was, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I was supposed to be born on Christmas Day, but I was finally born on January 3rd, 1943, so I was a war baby. I still have my ration book to prove that, with the stamps in it. Um, my mother was from a suburb on the west side, Avon, a small, a small suburb, and my father was from uh, Cleveland Heights. Um, they met. Um, he was um, a, a lingerie salesman, and she was actually working in a women's apparel store in Illyria, and that's how they met. Uh, she had never gone beyond eighth grade. I think maybe she went to business school for a year. Sure. And my father graduated from high school, Shaw High School. And uh, I went to parochial school. We lived in, in Cleveland Heights when I was born and in Lyndhurst. Um, and I was always a reader. I remember going to the library often. I remember um, also going to the movies every Saturday afternoon. We lived near the Richmond Theater and I would go there on my own and for 10 cents you'd see your double feature and your serials and your cartoons and so forth. And um, I remember telling my, when I finally taught short fiction on film, I used uh, Bad Day at Black Rock, a Spencer Tracy film, and that actually I think was the first really adult film that I saw and I must have seen it about 10 years old. I was going to these things on my own. But we had gone to a lot of movies. We had gone to um, the Andrew Sisters and uh, uh, the Disney cartoons and so forth. I usually on Sunday afternoons uh, went at the Colony Theater and at, uh, in that area. And um, I really always liked going downtown in Cleveland. I'm a big city boy. Um, what was high school? Well, tell us about high school. I went to high school at uh, St. Joseph's High School, which at the time was a very large Catholic boys school, about 2,000 students. Um, I um, had really good um, English teachers, uh, though at that time I didn't know that I would go on in English, but I remember learning a lot of grammar from our Latin teacher, who was also our first year English teacher. Probably more grammar in the Latin course than in the English course, and he had us write every week. And I developed a real facility for, for writing, uh, and uh, writing usually you know, without a lot of rewriting. Um, when I was there, I edited the high school newspaper. We won a big award at the St. Bonaventure Press uh, Contest at Bon St. Bonaventure University in New York. Um, we also had a little uh, literary magazine we inserted in the in the, in the high school paper. Um, went to a lot of um, so-called art films at the time at the the theater in Cleveland Heights. Um, the uh, the foreign films. films that were coming in, uh, and uh, also went to you know. A lot of uh, musicals. There was a lot of summer theater in Cleveland and, and, and so forth. Like Blossom Center? Yeah. Well, Blossom Center wasn't actually there then. Okay. Uh, but, but Music Kane Carnival, Park. Kane, Kane Park, Park, and Music Carnival, and uh, Bo the, the Cleveland Pops played downtown at the time in public auditorium. But also, in, when I was in high school, the Great Lake Shakespeare Festival was there. Uh, getting ready to uh, move up to the 1964. Uh, 400th anniversary of, of Shakespeare's birth, and they actually, uh, over a period of years, did the entire canon of Shakespeare. And I saw a great many of those in the summers. Sure. Uh, at, uh, they performed in, in a high school auditorium in Lakewood. Um, and I went to, I took uh, both as a, as a, later in my elementary school years and in my high school years, I, I took art lessons at the uh, Art Museum and at the Cleveland Institute especially in the summers. Um, and so I always had an interest in, in art. Sure. Um, that was a good, good facility. Yeah. What after, then after high school? High school, I, I went to, for my undergraduate uh, degree, I went to Boston College. Um, How would you happen to select that? Well, I wanted That's to go far east. From home. It's far from home, and I wanted to go east. And um, so it was, it was Boston College or Fordham or Georgetown. Um, and I finally selected Boston College, I think, because there was a there was a neighbor who went there. I mean, I wasn't Jesuit educated in high school. Uh, uh, Ignatius, of course, was on the west side, and uh, not too many people from 
uh, our side of town actually went across town to, to Ignatius. Um, uh, but I, when I went to Boston College, uh, it was uh, a fairly small, at least the liberal arts college was fairly small at the time, about, I think only about 1,200 and all men uh, in liberal arts at the time, though there were women in education and in nursing and, and so forth. They had, the year before, the class before mine, they had admitted, uh, on an experimental basis, they had admitted seven women. And uh, they found that they simply could not put them into classes with the men, and they finally tutored them um, throughout their four years. Um, and they were called the Seven Wonders, like the, the, like the Seven Sister Colleges or something. Sure, exactly. Um, but Boston College, um, people thought I had come from, when you said you were from Ohio, they thought you'd come from west of the Mississippi. I mean, that was really far away, because most of the students in arts in liberal arts, arts and sciences were actually commuting students, commuters. There were dorms, uh, a lot of dorms, and, and, uh, th but most of the dorm students were from uh, New York, Connecticut, uh, that area. Um, so not too many. I think there were three of us from Cleveland uh, and a couple from, uh, a couple of us from Ashtabula, <laughs> uh, but a small contingent from, from Ohio at the sure, time. Right. Um, though it was interesting when I taught here uh, at, at Purdue, how many Boston College alums I had in my classes, my graduate classes eventually, because finally their, uh, Boston College became co-ed and is now a major uh, urban uh, university. But the um, English department there was, was very, very good. Uh, wonderful teachers, and in fact, probably the, the ones whom I modeled my own teaching on. Um, they tended to either have graduated or got their PhDs from uh, University of Chicago, so some new, new Aristotelians, or the University of Wisconsin, uh, where there were very famous professors, White, Wallerstein, and Quintana were there. And uh, in fact, when I came here to, um, uh, to Purdue to the English department, um, one of the faculty members, Andy DeVitas, I don't I at, remember uh, at the time, um, he had been with a lot of my teachers at Boston College, they had done their graduate work at Wisconsin. Uh, Edward Nels, who was a, uh, an expert in, in D.H. Lawrence uh, and who taught the modern drama course, which was my first real introduction to dramatic literature. Um, but I had really excellent, uh, excellent teachers. Uh, uh, Albert Duhamel for Shakespeare and Richard Hughes for the Metaphysical Poets. I mean, they were really terrific. Uh, Leonard Casper for Contemporary American Fiction. And um, I, I didn't uh, know that I was going to go on in English for graduate work. I was thinking of going on in American Studies because at Boston College, a lot of the history you took was intellectual history, both European and, and then American history. Um, and so I wasn't sure that I would go on, but I did stay there for my, for my master's. I had um, been literary editor of the yearbook and um, uh, at graduation was awarded the, what they called the, the, the Brick Award. The Gold Brick Award was the nickname and um, given to an all-around outstanding senior. And all of the other awards came with watches or checks. But this was supposedly so prestigious, all you got was a little gold key. But nothing ta very tangible or substantial. <laughs> Just the honor. The, the key to your heart. Yeah, so, but I, you know, like, like an early Phi Beta Kappa key. We didn't have Phi Beta Kappa at Boston College. Uh, the library was too small at the time. And so I was really pleased finally to uh, be elected to Phi Beta Kappa as an honorary member here at Purdue uh, in, in the 90s. I finally when the chapter Phi, finally got When the going. chapter got going, yeah. um, uh, I became a member of Phi Beta Kappa here because Boston College at the time, sure. now they have a chapter, but at the time their library. Yeah. Though their library had a tremendous collection, a really famous collection of, um, of Irish literature, um, uh, and, and still well, well known in Irish studies, of course. Sure. Um, Were there many lay teachers there? there yes, in fact, in, in um, I mean, all of us really as undergrads minored in theology and philosophy because we had so much theology and philosophy. We had, we had to take it. We had to take it. And um, uh, so I took, like, I think I probably took um, seven or eight philosophy courses, um, uh, and including uh, one taught by a... Um, the only um, woman professor I had in, in uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, Idella Gallagher, she and her husband were very well known in the Catholic Philosophical Association, and she taught um, 
contemporary um, uh, philosophy, which I took from her. Um, but there were very few um, uh, priests teaching in the English department. It was almost all lay faculty. I had a priest for freshman, for freshman uh, English, mm -hmm. but after that, uh, it was all lay faculty sure. actually, and uh, not all Catholic either. They had hired very, very widely. Um, uh, uh, so it, it was really there were some, um, uh, like Edward Nell's, uh, whom I mentioned, uh, was not was not Catholic. So they were hiring very, very widely, and it was a really superb uh, department. Um, they had a master's program, and I stayed on for the master's. Um, when I went for the master's, I really did my work in, um, in the novel. I wrote a master's thesis on uh, E.M. Forster. Um, uh, and when I was getting my master's, I was a teaching fellow, and I taught in the School of Nursing. So the first two years that I taught, I taught all women. There were no men going to nursing school back in 1964. And uh, so I had all very, um, uh, a lot of very, very bright young women, who uh, many of whom had gone to Eastern boarding schools and so forth. And then also we had um, uh, a number of women who had associate degrees, including a number of nuns who had three-year three -year degrees, who were coming back for the diploma, the four-year degree, sure. so they could become administrators and teachers. Right. And um, so I had, when I was teaching, I had um, women twice my age in my class, but I think we had a good time. They enjoyed it because it was something, uh, literature for them, of course, was a break from uh, <laughs> the, the science and so forth and so on. Sure. And um, so I, I um, at the time, I taught uh, Benedetto Croce's, uh, the very famous uh, Italian uh, art philosopher. Uh, his granddaughter was in my class. I taught a woman who would become dean of the Yale School of Nursing, and really, really very good. Very, very good well, you're students. talking about the background. Some of these students, if they've gone to the, the boarding schools and the prep schools and yeah. primary, or whatever, then you've got. I know the mix. Yeah, yeah right. And it was fine. I mean, the, the dean of uh, yeah, a few months into my teaching, the dean, uh, uh, Dean Kinane, who, who just died recently at 101 or something like that. She was dean of the nursing school for years and years. Uh, I remember called me in and she asked me um, if things were going okay and if I was having any problem teaching all of these women, you know. And, I said, no, it doesn't bother me at all. I said, we're doing fine. Uh, the, other, the other person who was teaching the um, uh, freshman nursing students literature was, was Father uh, Francis uh, X. Sweeney, um, who was the person who ran the humanities program at Boston College. He brought in all the lecturers, and he knew the famous, he knew the famous writers. Um, so when I was an undergrad, we, we saw Robert Frost, we saw T.S. Eliot, uh, Robert Penn Moore and oh, just everybody came. Well, in those Catherine, days it was easy to get these people. Catherine to come. Porter, oh, wow. uh, who I remember came in and gave her reading in this black satin gown with this orange satin stole, and just you know, um, she had a presence of very, a wonderful presence. Yeah, right, and she did. and I was active in the undergrad English Association. We used to bring in uh, poets, readers that we'd introduce, like X. J. Kennedy and May Swenson, and so you know, we met a lot of a lot of writers through um, this man who knew all these people. Just enriched the whole... Yeah. Thing. And, um, of course, when you're in Boston, a lot of writers come through the area and so forth, or lived in the area right. uh, and, and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, so I stayed there for my, for my master's. I probably would have stayed on for my PhD, though that's not advised, uh, you know, that you go to the same college for all three degrees or university. But um, they didn't have a PhD program in English at the time. They instituted it shortly after I uh, left there. And uh, so I came back to the, to the Midwest, but further west than, than I had, had been, and went to uh, the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, which was the smallest town I had ever lived in up to that point. Um, <laughs> Were my, you married did, by that time? No, I, met, I actually met my wife at uh, Illinois. She was a student in library science uh, there, and we met in a, in a dorm cafeteria. And um, uh, she sharing actually... Sharing lunch or something? Sharing lunch. Or dinner. There was a group of... Uh, uh, we got to know a group of, uh, uh, of people, uh, mainly people who were... Well, we were really in all fields. I don't know how the group sort of formed, but it did. Some of us in English, some in library. I think it, I think that um, it formed because a, a, a good friend, a person who became a good friend of mine, 
uh, had been there the summer before, and he got to know the librarians who went to school in the summer sure. as well. Sure. And uh, then I sort of, you know, met him. And right. but we had a real, uh, a varied group of people by the time we finished the year. Uh, and there were a, there were a few marriages that resulted from the group. Interesting. In well, that's very way. nice. Yeah. So that's that's where we met. Okay. And she was she was an Illinois farm girl. Okay. Uh, she got a library degree there. Got then? a library degree there, and then she went on. Um, uh, we were engaged, and she went on and taught a year in or or, or worked a year as a children's librarian in Chicago. Uh, she had one of those Illinois grants where you afterwards you had to teach two years in or or work. You had to work for two years in an Illinois library. Yeah. And so she worked for a year in Chicago uh, as a children's librarian uh, at one of the branches. And then when we were married, she came down and worked as a children's librarian in the Champaign Public Library. And um, uh, we were married the last, I was there for four years uh, uh, doing coursework and, and prelims. And she doing, were you doing teaching while you were there? I teaching? taught. Oh. The, the, entire, the, the whole four years I taught, in fact, the last year I taught full time. Uh, I taught uh, advanced composition at first, and then I taught introduction to drama, introduction to poetry. Um, and it was as much as, you know, as we, we tell our students, our graduate students, you know, how sort of easy they have it now. I mean, at that time, you actually wrote prelims in five areas. Uh, and so you needed, you wrote in a number of areas where you had had no coursework. And so you worked all of this up on your own. So it was, it was a fairly rigorous. Language. You had to meet the yeah, you had, to, you had to read two foreign languages. I did French and German, though I must admit I really never used them in my research. But that was the requirement at the time, right. and you and you did old English as well. The Latin uh, was not one of the languages. No, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> Although Latin we're was not. very well. Though I had that. I had taken four years of Latin in high school, <laughs> um, and we knew but, all the songs in Latin. We memorized, yeah. right? And uh, the, though I had had not gone on with Latin in college, sure. I had, had taken a couple years of French in college, um, and I did my my work in um, at Illinois was mostly in um, Victorian literature. Uh, which I somehow had, you know, escaped or slighted in my earlier uh, studies. And in fact, my first publication actually uh, grew out of a paper I did uh, in a Victorian literature course for uh, uh, Donald Smalley, who was uh, a fairly well-known person in Browning studies. Uh, I did a paper on Tennyson and Milton that was finally published. Um, and um, but I did my work mainly in dramatic literature. Uh, in drama as a genre. I studied under, um, well, my director was Alan Holliday, uh, who edited the Chapman plays, but I also um, uh, studied under Gwyn Evans, who went on to edit the, the Riverside Shakespeare, uh, which became, of course, one of the standard uh, uh, Shakespearean texts. Sure. Um, uh, he, by the time I, by the time I left there, he had left Harvard. He'd been called back to Harvard. You know, Harvard really only hires its own as full professors. They go back. They, they may be different now, but then but that's he was doing. called back to Harvard uh, in the middle of editing the Riverside Shakespeare. Uh, I'll never forget. He, he was a, uh, an interesting uh, uh, person, but a little bit absent-minded. I mean, a little bit of the stereotype. But, uh, one day he came in, and I was taking him for non-dramatic Shakespearean literature. He came in and started teaching a totally different course that he just thought we were, you know. And so we had to stop him and say, that's not this class, you know, it's <laughs> some other class. Those are the ones we remember, right? <laughs> they stick in our minds. But, um, uh, so I, and, and there were really, uh, Illinois was a very highly rated department at the time, maybe fifth or sixth in the nation. Some of those people had, had left for other places, but um, uh, Barker was there in Milton and Smalling in Victorian and uh, uh, Evans good, and Shakespeare, good, good, group, yeah. good group of people. Right, yeah. um, uh, but again, mainly, mainly, uh, it's surprising uh, at that time. Maybe not surprising for the time, how few uh, women professors I had uh, when I was in college, uh, That's interesting, and, yeah. and really none, none except for the language studies for uh, at, at Illinois, uh, none. Uh, there were women there. They were hiring, beginning to hire more women, sure. but. Um, it was really a fairly male-dominated profession yeah. at the time. How did you like Champaign-Urbana? Um, like? Well, like well, yeah, we, I lived in the graduate dorm okay. for a couple of years, and then uh, we lived in an apartment when we were married, of sure. course. Um, and while we were there, the um, Cranard Center for the Performing Arts opened. Oh, wow. 
And I had done a, a you could minor when you were getting a PhD in English, and I did my, I think I was the only person who, who minored in theater history. And so I got to know yeah. uh, uh, some of nice the professors and, and some of the, some of the um, uh, students who went on to uh, you know, important careers in acting. But while I was there, the Cranard Center opened uh, for the performing arts. Um, and I, I did the reviewing for the, I reviewed for the local paper, I reviewed the theater productions for a couple of years for the local paper. The local champagne paper? Uh, for the champagne paper, uh -huh. yeah. Um, I hadn't really done any, I did some book reviews before that for, for papers, but never, never theater reviewing. Um, that means you have to go to the performances. Go to the performances, and, and I did sure. the local, so I, I reviewed both the, both the professional things that came in, that the equivalent of convocations brought in, and also the, the university things yeah. I reviewed. Uh, well, and, was a nice and they did, yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, in Champaign, I mean, it was, um, uh, as I said, it was a small town for me. Um, you could go to Chicago on the train and take the milk train back, you know, go up for one day and take the train back, uh, and I, which I would do occasionally when, when Winnie was working up there. Sure. Um, but it was it was uh, you know different uh, to be Quite in a such a small yeah. yeah and and from Cleveland even Cleveland, when I was oh, yeah. in when I grew up in Cleveland I mean Cleveland this was way before the Kyle R River caught fire oh yeah right. and I mean downtown was a wonderful place to 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 go oh, yeah. um, quite cut so well that's where yeah. the Rockefellers got started Long yeah and Euclid yeah. Avenue was the house oh I know the Francis yeah. Payne Bolton yes so, and yeah. and you know the that uh, uh, you know the the area around the art museum there, and, and the Severance Hall, and the, remember the the Epworth Methodist Church that had the copper tower that looked like an upside down oil can, looked like an, one of those squeeze oil cans, uh, right. because of all the oil money that was there. And so right. it was really, so Champagne was a very was for me a very Quite small, a very right. small town. I had really good students from the Chicago suburbs in my classes. Um, uh, you know, when you have a large urban area uh, around Chicago, those, those high schools north of Chicago, northeast of Chicago, turned out really good students. Right. So I have some really terrific students in my classes. Right. And, you know, you develop friends among your, your fellow teaching assistants and so forth. Right. Um, but it was, um, you know, really intense, intense work as well to get finished in that length right. of time. Um, there were very few people who started with me who finished I think only one other one who finished within four years like I did and it was a good thing we did because we entered the profession just when jobs were getting scarce so another couple of years and it was getting harder and harder to to get uh, you know, academic then after you finished, is that when you came to Purdue? I came to Purdue and this, oh, I, had I, had spent my, I spent my entire uh, professional career at Purdue uh, after my PhD um, it's sort of interesting I I, at that time, uh, you came here in, in 1970, 1970, yeah. 1970 yeah. at that time, um, departments didn't advertise uh, position openings like they do now. There was no such thing like the MLA job list. And so you just wrote these letters. Uh, you got the names of the chairs at various departments, and you wrote and you told them about yourself, and if, said if you have an opening in my area, you'd like to be... Considered my, I considered my area uh, dramatic literature, but mainly medieval Tudor and Elizabethan, um, uh, since I had written under somebody in, in uh, Elizabethan literature. Um, but uh, I wrote a, at the time, I, when I wrote to Purdue, I just wrote a Dear Sir letter because they had had a new head and I didn't know the person's name. If I had known the person's name, I probably never would have written because it was Jacob Adler. And so I probably wouldn't have written to a professor Adler to, as an Adler to ask for a job. Um, but it turned out that he... Are you sure you don't want genealogy? <laughs> he, he, uh, he interviewed me, and um, this was his first year. He did very extensive hiring in uh, lots of areas, and um, uh, I was the person that he brought in in modern, in, in drama, in modern drama especially. Uh, he taught modern drama, in fact, along with 18th century. But there was a, a large cadre, really, of people who had been in drama studies here at Purdue. Um, uh, you know, some fairly well-known people like Richard Cordell and uh, uh, Al Fulton, who also started the first film course in the Midwest. 
back in like 1948. Uh, uh, but there were, when I came here, uh, so I came mainly to teach drama. And I did teach um, both at the grad and undergrad level. I did teach the medieval, the Tudor, the Elizabethan, the Shakespearean. Uh, but I found myself more and more teaching the modern British and the modern American, especially mm -hmm. the modern American. That's what you research uh, and so almost all my uh, research, um, except for a couple of early papers in uh, Victorian poetry and Elizabethan poetry, um, was in modern American and modern British drama. Uh, when I came here, there were six of us actually teaching in, in English teaching uh, modern drama courses. And by the time I retired, I was the lone person. And now there probably will not be another person hired specifically for dramatic literature. Uh, Tennessee Williams was one of your... Yeah, Tennessee Williams is really my major research interest. Um, uh, in fact, I was on the committee when Williams came here in uh, 1970, the spring of 72, for literary awards. And I actually... Um, it was a coup to get been, it, Well, yeah, I, I wasn't chair of the committee. Um, Margaret Church was oh, chair of the committee, sure. who became one of my real favorites among the uh, professors nice in English. I mean, she, again, she was the only woman full professor at the time in English. I imagine. And I imagine she was uh, Radcliffe, um, uh, Harvard PhD, and had taught at Duke and then came here. And I imagine that she had a really fairly rough time among all of those men on the primary committee, but <laughs> you know. And, uh, but she was chair of the committee, but um, she turned over to me uh, sort of taking care of Williams. And so, Oh, how um, great. For a couple days, I mean, I went down, I drove down to Indianapolis to meet him at the airport with uh, Gene Kildall, who was in theater. He went down with me, and um, we, Williams arrived with his, with his secretary. He, he had a, um, uh, a secretary with him, uh, traveling, a man traveling with him. And then he brought along an, a, a husband, a brother and sister acting team, uh, Alfred Ryder and Olive Deering. Ryder was the um, the redheaded man who was in a lot of the Mission Impossible shows, the villain usually in the Mission Impossible shows. And we were we were in the, um, I mean Tennessee did like to have a drink, and so while we were waiting for the for Olive and, and Alfred to arrive, we went, of course went to the bar. And then they arrived, and we were sitting there having a drink, and this this man got off a bar stool at the came over to our table. And he said, I really have to, you know, introduce myself and meet you. And, of course, I thought he was going to meet, introduce himself to Williams. No, he knew Alfred Ryder from Mission Impossible. He didn't know Tennessee Williams at all. He knew Alfred Ryder. Well, so. God forbid. <laughs> and then, then we drove up. I shouldn't say. We, we drove up to, to, uh, to Lafayette, and um, uh, Tennessee said, he said, you know, I really need to stop at the, at the liquor store before I get to the hotel. And it was, it was about midnight, and I stopped. There was a, a liquor store next to Sarge Bilt's there on, on sure. 52, and we just made it. And he went in and bought a few bottles, and, and uh, then when we checked in at the, at the, the, union? At the union, he had his, his paper bag of, of bottles, and I don't think there was much liquor in the union at the time. Uh, I'm sure people did bring it in in their suitcases and so forth, but he signed the guest book. And, and then he... he um, you know, I did things like t I took him swimming at the Colrec because he swam every day, and I took him out to buy kale pectate, and I took him to <laughs> lunch. And but he, you know, he was he was really easy to get along. People have this impression that these people are temperamental and difficult. He was not difficult at all. I mean, I I didn't when I met these people. I met a lot of people over the years. I never really tried to pump them for anything that would help me with my writing or anything. And I think that helps if they don't think if they think that you're out there to try to use them or get something from them. But they I never the did message, that. They get the message. Yeah. Right. So I never did that. And I mean, it's true he autographed a paperback for me, but you know, we didn't we didn't do that kind of thing. And I didn't. Um, you just hosted him. Yeah. I didn't bring him to class or anything like that. I didn't put any demands on him at all, and just spent time with him. And then he, um, um, before the literary awards banquet, the Hansons, Art and Nancy, gave a party at Westwood, and I, I told I reminded. When I went to Art Hansen's memorial visitation the other day, I, I saw Paul was the son. And I said, you know, the first time that I really met your dad was when he hosted the party for Tennessee Williams. He and Nancy had the party at, at Westwood. Uh, they were the first people, president who had lived in Westwood. When I came, it was the last year Fred Hovde uh, had done the welcome, and uh, then, then Art Hansen was in. And, uh, and in fact, um, for the longest time in, in English, uh, in my office in English, 
until I retired, I actually had a, uh, a wing-back chair and an ottoman that had been in the Hansons living room at Westwood. When the Hansons left, the furniture went to salvage, and Alan Heyman bought this at salvage and put it in his office and passed it on to me. And then I passed it on to a, a, a graduate student. I said this chair was actually in, in the president's mm -hmm. house <laughs> at Purdue. And uh, what I have in my office at English, it was, uh, it was occupied by some very important people who come for literary awards, like Seamus Heaney sat in it for a while before he went over <laughs> and so forth. But I had the chair in the ottoman for a long, long time. Uh, and then Tennessee went to the banquet, and um, uh, they brought their liquor in the bag. When they found out there would be no wine at dinner in the Union, uh, this was, you know, you can't have a meal without wine. And it, 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 the food was not really very good. I mean, back then in the Union, the, few, the food was not. The they can do it if they want to, and they can't. Well, that, now they can really do it much better. But back in those days, the, rub, the, the roast beef was not really very tender and so forth. But, but um, they sat up there at the head table, and they would take out the bottle of wine and pour <laughs> bottle of liquor and pour something to their glass, put the bottle back in the bag, and so forth. And no one said anything to them. Uh, we no didn't see anything. And then, then I was supposed to, I was charged by the department to, to bring Tennessee afterwards to a faculty party so the faculty could meet him. Uh, but some graduate students in the theater got to him after the banquet and invited him to a, to a student party in a sort of rundown house here in Lafayette, or West Lafayette, and then to a place in Lafayette. And um, I couldn't get him away. And so here I was, untenured. I had to go to the faculty party and say, I'm sorry, you're not going to meet and see Tennessee Williams because I can't get away from the students. And so I had failed to bring them, bring him to my colleagues. But that wasn't the, uh, <coughs> so I was on literary awards committee um, uh, the, the following year. It was my turn to chair literary awards. And I chaired it later on also. Uh, I brought in Stephen Spender one year. I brought in Edward Albee, who was absolutely wonderful, uh, uh, terrific with the students. And I had met Albee a number of times uh, before that. But. Um, the year after Williams, I brought in um, uh, how can Anthony Burgess, and um, uh, you know everything was everything was I had lined him up and so forth, and everything was announced. The tickets were sold, and all the publicity was out. And his agent called me a few days before the banquet and said, "Mr. Burgess won't come." And I said, you can't do this. I said, you know, uh, this would be a terrible thing if he didn't come. And, and he said, well, he's in Boston. Um, there was a tryout of a musical that he had written uh, based on Cyrano de Bergerac. I don't think it really was very successful ever. And they offered me, in place of Burgess, the agent offered me the Watergate burglars and the Watergate people. I could have John Dean or I could have Colt. I said, you know, as if we'd want these people, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I said, I said, Burgess has simply got to come. And so I called Burgess's house and talked to his Portuguese housekeeper <laughs> and told her why I was calling. And she told me how to get in touch with him in Boston. And he indeed came, and, uh, but didn't cut, stay very long. He flew in. Uh, we picked him up at the airport, or maybe Andy DeVitas, who had written the book on him, picked him up. We brought him up. He gave the talk, a wonderful talk uh, about um, Art Hansen, I remember. And, and Art's. Um, First uh, provost, I don't know what he was called back then, but Cotton Robinson, Cotton Robinson right. yeah. and who who sat at the um, uh, sat next to my wife at the you know back in back then the there was always a head table for the literary awards. Yet um, uh, I remember Cotton Robinson sat next to my wife and told her risque jokes during the <laughs> dinner. <laughs> but uh, Burgess gave a wonderful talk; everybody loved it. But then he just left uh, uh, as soon as. Uh, he had done that, but he, he had saved, sort of saved me because people would have been furious if oh. I, if I brought you know the Watergate, the, yeah. the whatever, oh. <laughs> which I wouldn't have done. But you know, because no. because you know literary awards is very prestigious. We've had you know <laughs> some of the world's most Jesus, famous writers there, <laughs> you know, and they have a different story to tell. <laughs> yeah, and so so he did come, and uh, he left a um, um, left a. a a lit cigar in our bedroom, and so it burned a hole in something in our bedroom when he changed clothes up there or something. But, you know, whatever. whatever. <laughs> but so I, I did. I you know you. you uh, over the years, you know, there were there were just wonderful writers who came to literary awards. Mm -hmm. so.
Let's talk a little bit about some of your administrative things. Uh, talk about uh, you were assistant head. I was assistant head of English. It was sort of uh, funny to have Adler and Adler. It was like hanging out a law on a shingle. Right? You know, yeah. Adler and Adler had an yeah. assistant head, and, right. and you know, people would call and they'd, you'd have to say, which one do you want? When people would call and ask for sure. Professor Adler. And um, mainly your duties back then were scheduling faculty um, uh, courses, class schedules, and the class courses, schedules yeah. uh, uh, deciding which courses would be taught and who would teach them, uh, you know, trying to accommodate people's wants and needs and so forth, um, involvement in recruitment, faculty recruitment. Um, uh, you ran the department picnic, which my own children always hated because it meant a hot Sunday in August, you know, or September all day working because at that time you, you just did everything uh, for the department picnic. <laughs> um, uh, things like, we could but, write a book on yeah, but, that. But the English department at the, you know, back in the 1970s when I came, yeah. there was a very distinct culture among faculty members. I don't know if the English department was different from other departments or not, but um, there was a lot of socializing. Um, uh, did you, the Braswells? Oh yeah, yeah, the Braswells. I mean, they, they did. Uh, they were good. Oh yeah, the, Bra the, Bras the Braswells, the, the Isingers, the Crowders, uh, right. the uh, Cotlers. Um, oh yeah. Uh, lots and lots of socializing and um, among the, the among the faculty. Right. And a lot of the wives knew one another because sure. most of the wives were not working. Um, and they had um, there were just lots of cocktail parties and lots of uh, Sunday night suppers, and you were expected to reciprocate. You were invited, and then they expected to be invited. And despite the fact that you might have a couple of babies, you know, under two years old in your house, you were still expected to get sure. to get dinner and entertain and so forth. And we did it. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, Nell Braswell was yeah. always having. Oh yeah, always having parties, and right. Nell was a lot of fun. And oh, yeah. and uh, uh, and Nell was from Demopolis, uh, George, I remember, and. Uh, um, He'd come from Duke, hadn't he? Yeah. We, yeah a a number of PAC faculty in our department came from Duke, actually. Uh, Margaret Church, Rick Reichard, Hugo Reichard, uh, uh, Bill Kearse come from Duke. And later on, uh, with the group that I came with, uh, Clayton Lean was from Duke. And then when I was head later on, I hired two people from Duke. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so Duke has supplied us with uh, a yeah. good well, number, cool. good number of people. That's cool. school's been going for a long time, yeah. particularly there. Um, the grad school and making a Yeah, then I, after that I, um, <clears throat> though I kept teaching and writing, um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, all while I was doing this, I, I became associate dean of the graduate school. That was, I think, mainly by happenstance. I uh, was on the faculty senate, the university senate, and sitting next to me was Brother Arnott, because alphabetical order, Adler Arnott. I had never met this man before, and, you know, got to know him a little bit, and he needed an, uh, uh, somebody who was associate dean, um, uh, was leaving and he needed an associate dean and, and asked me if I would come in, check with, check with uh, my dean if, to see if this would be okay and um, brought me into the graduate school where I, where I was in charge of um, uh, fellowships at the beginning. And then as I became senior associate dean, I just sort of did a lot of things including filling in between uh, Struthers' term and Bob Rinkle's term. Um, do they so, have as many associates there? Uh, associate not as many associate deans. Uh, we were assigned certain areas right, for okay. curriculum development. Sure, right. And and liaison. 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 Right. And, but I did a lot of, uh, at the time, Steve Byrne in, uh, was with me in uh, the office. Uh, Steve and I had been at Illinois together. We didn't know each other at Illinois. We, we both demonstrated against Dow Chemical uh, at Illinois, because this was the Vietnam years. In fact, the day that I... The day that I uh, defended my dissertation, uh, at that time dissertations were pu uh, defenses were public and a calendar was published and so forth. The day that I defended, uh, the university was shut down for student strike, and um, my director insisted, since the date had been time had been published, that the defense go on, and so it was at his house, uh, and so there were you know nobody came except the members of the committee. So I'm not sure that the that my degree was actually legal or legitimate, but I mean, I never told anybody about that. Whatever. Uh, you spoke but yeah, but anyway. But anyway, we had you know, um, um, you know, we had we had marched. We've been activists uh, at, at the time. And, and Steve, I know, told me later, uh, says I didn't know him when he was there, but we were together in the grad school. And, and Jane Cayley, and uh, what was um, who was interested in women in science, was in the graduate school at the time. And we just you know we did uh, at that time. Um, uh, 
the dean was both um, and research as well. Was research dean of the graduate school and and head of, of research, and so there was um, you you gave out the um, uh, well. The day, they were called David Ross grants back then. You administered those. You administered fellowships. You administered just lots of things. Um, in, in fact, one one time, um, uh, it said in the exponent um, when it used to list grants that I'd been awarded four million dollars from the National Science Foundation. Well, you know, people said, "What are you?" Well, it was I. I had been in my name. My name was on the National Science Foundation grants for graduate students coming in. You know that kind. But finally, I did just dispersor. yeah. Finally, okay. I did just about everything in the graduate yeah, school, and I, I stayed on for um, for four years because, as I say, Bob Ringle came in, and, uh, um, and he carried the same thing. He was also the still yes. research. Yes, and then um, uh, when in that interim period, of course, um, uh, I worked with Bob Greencorn, uh, who was head of um, vice president for research, or worked in that in that office sure. anyway. Um, I think became that maybe after Struther left. I'm not sure, but um, um, and, and so the, the thing about working in the graduate school was that was the time that I really got to know people all over the campus. Yeah, yeah. Because before that, you know, I you, you knew people in English and you knew people in your own college mainly, sure. and you'd meet people occasionally outside mainly when your when your your children uh, had friends, your children had friends and their parents. Right. But by being in the graduate school, I just got to know people all over the campus right, exactly. uh, because I was calling and, and working with them on with various them. things. Right, yeah. exactly. And, and then, then I, uh, well, then I be, then I became associate dean of liberal arts. Uh, it, you know, I never thought when I went into English that I'd ever be an administrator. You know, I thought I would be just a professor and and researcher, never. writer. You know, and and it turned out that I've done. I did finally about twenty one years of administration. Um, uh, either full or half time. And the graduate school job started out half time, and I was filling in that would become full time and so forth. Um, but then I became uh, associate dean of liberal arts um, uh, under David Caputo. Right. And the I school had been split by that time. Yeah. Eighty-nine. Well, actually, it was it was um, humanities, social sciences, and education, and then. Um, I chaired the committee that renamed it as the as a school of liberal arts so when education the left, and uh, the, the the other major thing that I did, um, uh, along with filling in for David, David was very um, uh, active um, in in his own research, uh, uh, election politics and election monitoring and so forth and so on. And, um, so I, I did a lot of filling in over the years for him, but I, I, the main thing I did was chair the, uh, what became known as the Curriculum 2000 Committee, uh, where we redid the core curriculum. And uh, we put in, into place a really very comprehensive um, uh, curriculum that required a great deal of diversity. Uh, the students uh, had to take courses in gender and ethnicity and non-Western cultures and so forth and so on. They had to do, um, uh, you know, a lab, uh, a lab course. They had to do a, uh, uh, just a lot of things that had not been required before right. in an attempt to, to uh, make the curriculum um, such that they would be introduced to just a wide range of, uh, of subject matter and, in fact, you know, it, uh, really, it was the years when everybody, people were trying to put in these these curricula um, that would just make sure that people had taken some introductory work in these areas, particularly of, of race and ethnicity and gender. And it was a hard sell. I mean, it was um, uh, never easy. No, and and uh, it was a, a difficult sell because um, it meant that. Um, as the core grew, that people had to take things out of the major or, or take things out of the minor, and I went around to, actually went around to the um, departments, to every department, and sort of sold it to the departments. I remember one person I knew, I um, in psychology said to me, he said, "I wouldn't do what you uh, have to do if they paid me the world." He said, "Just stand up there and get you know <laughs> that criticism and that." And you know, you just you and, and it passed finally. It passed by you a substantial need a lot of margin. One. A lot of that is a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, one-on-one. -on -one. You've got to talk about and talk to people, and you just have to. Uh, 
he got great support. We had one student member of the, of the committee who really was very, very proactive in wanting these kinds of diversity courses. I don't um, think in those days, Tom, that they, uh, many of the committees did not have student representation. Yeah, that was something that David Computer did insist on. We, uh, we had student representation. Now they, yeah, now, it, now yeah. Even yeah. in the, the search committees. Yeah, search committees. Yeah, when I first came, you know, the search committees would not, well, we, there weren't really search committees. They had yeah. and the assistant heads sort of did it themselves. Sure. But yeah, I was here over the years when you began adding uh, right. graduate students and undergraduate students to search committees. And um, I, I had and maybe s continued to have some problems with that because the, the thing that worried me always about that was confidentiality. Because these graduate students are going to see uh, letters of recommendation about people who may in turn become their professors. And I was always concerned about the fact that that things that should not be known outside of the committee would be spread among graduate students. That was my major concern mm -hmm. with that. That can be a concern. And, and, um, uh, uh, and also, I, I, you know, I think that the, there, there's a difference between, uh, but they do bring a difference, they bring a welcome perspective uh, to the committees oftentimes, and I, saw, I, I got to know a lot of graduate students mm -hmm. well that way. Right. Um, but also it can be, uh, I remember when I was, uh, jump ahead a minute, when I was interim dean of uh, the college uh, the second time and had um, uh, set up a committee to search for new director of women's studies uh, made up of faculty and graduate students, the graduate students and the faculty were very divided on who they wanted. And um, I finally um, sided with the faculty members over the graduate students because I felt that the faculty members are permanent. They are the people who have to work with this person as a colleague. The graduate students come, they get, they do their work, they get the degree, and they leave. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can present, it That's can present good. problems. But you know, you have to, you if you appoint a faculty committee, you've got to respect their, their and interest. of course, faculty committees might not always choose the person you want chosen either. <laughs> That's right, exactly. But that yeah. was mainly what I did as associate dean, and, and yeah. I did that. Uh, sort of and then, you were and then and you were in the head of English department. Then. Yeah, I was interim. I was interim dean of liberal arts for a year and a half after David left to become president of Hunter. He later became president of Pace University, and um, um, I never really wanted to be permanent dean. I didn't become a candidate. Uh, I, I never really had any desire to be the full time permanent dean. I um, I never really liked. Um, very much the uh, fundraising aspect of the deanship, which has become more and more important. I mean, I did it when I had to. I met with donors and was successful, and I, I enjoyed it. I met wonderful people when I was interim dean. My wife and I met really interesting people, uh, al alums and friends, um, you know, here and elsewhere in the country, and uh, some of whom we've, we've remained friends with. We still hear from Christmas time and so forth. Um, but I really never liked that. I did it. And I was fine at it, but I never really liked that part of it. I, 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 I liked even less the obligation to go to the football games. I'm not a sports fan at all. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, ridiculously um, difficult for me to sit down and watch a football game. I, I grew up in Cleveland, and, and, and the Cleveland Indians, the baseball team, when I was young, when I was in grade school, was really a super team. And, and I used to go to the games often, and a lot of the, um, uh, particularly the pitchers, uh, lived in our neighborhood during the summer, and so we'd know them. I mean, uh, I'd see Bob Feller regularly, and Jack Lemon, and Garcia, and Wynn, and these people, and so forth and so on, um, and, and went religiously to a lot of the baseball games. But I was never a football fan, even though my, my grandfather's cousin was Paul Brown, uh, the coach of Cleveland Browns. And, my father uh, went to all the games. Yeah, and I never really had much. And, and my, when I was in college at Boston College, my roommate for my last um, uh, two years was Chuck Sullivan, whose father, Billy Sullivan, had founded the Boston Patriots. And, and I never went to a Patriots game. They always said, you can come to a game if you want to. And I never had any interest. And I, I, this was sort of, you know, I don't know I, they, they still had me to the, the they still had me to their house for Thanksgiving dinner and so forth and didn't feel any less about me that I didn't like football. <laughs> But now my son, our younger son lives in Boston. He's, he makes up for it. He's a rabid um, Patriot doing fan. Patriots fan and Celtics and the Red Sox. Uh, Red Sox. Yeah, he's just absolutely, so he makes up for my lack of interest he's in sports. He's taken up where dad left off. But, you know, so I, I, I never really, you know, enjoyed going to the football games, especially the first time I was in Room D, we were still without the covered stadium, so you'd sit there in the freezing cold. And I'll never forget one game. It was late in the season, and 
uh, I think it was Wisconsin, and we, my wife and I were free, just freezing. We were, you know, you're sitting there, and you're so cold, and we got up to go to the restroom between the third and fourth quarter, and Bob Ringel, who was, uh, pro, was he called, I'm not sure he was called Vice pro, President, Vice Vice President, President Affairs, yeah. he was a few, a few hours ago, and he said, he said, you better come back for the rest of this, or your budget will hurt, you know, and so I, you know, we dutifully came back for the rest of the game, but you were usually entertaining people. It became much less painful when I, when I was up in, um, in the box in the cupboard. The second time I was in Room Dean, we had the cupboard box and food. That and you does could, enhance it. Yeah, and you could, you could, you know, um, uh, just sit there and talk to people, and you didn't have to pay much attention to the game, really, because you could and do your stuff. fundraising bid and so forth and, and talk to other deans and people. <laughs> but, uh, but I never really had any desire to be permanent dean of the college. Okay, um, there are others. And I, so I, and I didn't, when I left that, I didn't expect to become head of English. I thought I would just be a professor. And, but then I was head of English for five years. Um, uh, and um, I found the headship a more difficult job than the deanship. I think it is a more difficult job. Uh, you have more personnel problems and more issues you have to work. You don't have a support staff, you have a dean's office. And uh, it was just, a, it was a difficult um, uh, job. I, I think, um, and I told the, when I became interim dean, again, I, I, I always told the, uh, the heads that I realized that their job was more difficult. I, 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 it was good that I had done it. I think I saw what they were facing. And um, I, I think one of the major uh, things that I did accomplish when I was uh, was head was we hired very very well, um, and I always told the other heads I said you, they would complain about budgetary problems and I said the the best thing you can do is to hire well, and take advantage every advantage you can of bringing in people because you don't know when the money will be there, so we hired very very well and we and I brought in, did a lot of spousal hiring just an enormous amount of spousal hiring uh, in English and then when I was interim dean the two times in, in the in the college. And we got some terrific people that way. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, as head, you have, you know, you're, you're doing faculty salaries, you're doing budgets, you're doing uh, the usual kinds of administrative things, along with, I always taught and I always kept writing uh, during all of my years. You're talking about you didn't want to be the dean, but they probably approached you. Would you be, do you wish to have yourself considered as a candidate? You probably have to tell them. Well, probably. I did. I mean, when I was in dean the first time, Bob Ringle asked me if I was, would be a candidate, and I think I probably could have been appointed permanent dean. And I said, no, I, there were uh, enormous budgetary issues facing the college. And I knew that those were not going to be um, eradicated. Uh, and I, I just didn't think that there was going to be uh, enough that I could do and um, I tried to get the college in the best shape budgetarily as I could for the incoming dean. Sure. And um, this, then when I uh, became interim dean the second time, um, uh, a dean had left um, uh, or was removed very, very suddenly by Sally Mason, who was provost at that time, and she called me and asked me if I would come back in. In fact, I had gone back into the dean's office as interim associate uh, dean for research. Yeah, I saw it right, yeah. uh, so I have various titles that I've had for six months or whatever. There was a period of six months when I was actually acting head of visual and performing arts uh, when they were still in the Quonset huts and I used to go over every afternoon and <laughs> sort of um, I gave a couple of you know do that kind of there. thing you know and I got to know those people very yeah, well. Right. Um, when I was interim dean the first time in fact um, uh, Dennis Ichiyama who was head of uh, BPA uh, said, he said, don't you want to be permanent dean and you can be the dean when, when uh, the new uh, visual performing arts building is dedicated? And I said to him, Dennis, that will not happen in my lifetime because it hadn't, it hadn't really been started. And it turned out the <laughs> second time that I was interim dean, they had the dedication. The dedication. And so I wound up, you know, <laughs> doing the remarks of the dedication. I was the dean. <laughs> but I had avoided all the pain in the middle of the there planning you know, and right. the building yeah. of that. Yeah. And um, uh, so I was interim dean a second time for just a year uh, during uh, that period. Um, first time in a year and a half for just a year. And then after that, I did go back to uh, English and taught. But I was just a professor for a couple of years before I retired. Okay. Yeah. Um, how about any awards or honors that you want uh, to Well, I mean, Phi Beta Kappa stands out. Okay. Um, um, 
and you really, get some teaching things or yeah I mean there were you know there were smart. were certificates for graduate teaching I I think I was always uh, better liked by my graduate students than my undergraduate students I think my undergraduates found me a little difficult uh, a little demanding I, I think I was demanding I was very demanding on their writing um, okay. I spent a lot a lot of time an awful lot of time you know um, editing and helping their writing or trying to They'd often just wondered why do you, you know, they, they, they really weren't that interested in having all of this notation on their writing. But my, my, my line finally became, you know, when they'd say, why do you do this? I'd say, you know, um, there's going to come a day when you're going to write something very, very important. I said, a letter of application for a job, and you don't want to look stupid. You know, and, but, you know, they, but I, I was a demanding undergrad teacher, I, uh, especially as far as the writing goes. And a kind of no-nonsense uh, teacher. I was never, I was never an entertainer. I don't think it's just not in my personality. I wasn't a jokey. I didn't tell jokes and stories and so forth. I guess I have a sense of humor that is a little different from it, maybe it's dry you and subtle. Stuff. You have your but own it, But I, I just was never a show person, you know. And and so they worked, and I it wasn't. And and um, but I, I graduate students, I think, found, liked me a lot better. And you work um, more closely at that level. I anyway. worked more closely, and they, they appreciated the help that I gave them in the writing. Um, the the graduate students, even in our ret comp program, um, uh, there was a time when they used to have to take literature courses, and they used to, a lot of them took my American drama or my British drama and loved it, and would thank me afterwards for the help I gave them in writing. And I know that, that one of the directors of the program said that she knew that I helped the students write better. Because graduate student, just because you're a graduate student, doesn't mean you're going to be a good writer. That's right. Exactly. And uh, a lot of them were not good writers. And I spent a lot of time right. uh, trying to help them with the their writing. Right. Yeah. And um, but it, it's different. You need to know more to uh, teach graduate students. But it's not as difficult in the classroom because there's they're more ready to uh, respond. I mean, I always talk by the discussion method and. I didn't lecture, and a lot of undergrads didn't care for that either. They wanted, they wanted somebody who would come in and give them a lot of information they could take down and then pare it back. Right. And um, I, I just was never that type of teacher. We always had discussion, a very little, very little lecture. Uh, interaction. Is interaction, great. and I would ask questions, and and uh, you know, and, and it, that was not a. Not something that a lot of them, a lot of them like. I had great success in in, in certain courses. I, I think the people who took uh, when I did the short story on a film, they liked that class a lot. Uh, I'm not saying I had that 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 I didn't do well as an undergrad teacher. I think there were a lot of them who did appreciate me, but but a lot of them found me a, a difficult, demanding teacher yeah. and, a, and a no nonsense kind of teacher. That's okay. Um, outstanding event. Anything that you'd like to share with us? I mean, here at Purdue? Any, or? Pl any place. Any well, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I always like to say maybe the outstanding event is yet to come or something, you there know. You go. Right, exactly. Uh, I mean, meeting my wife, uh, you know, Good we've, one. That's we've what been I best guess, friends, right. uh, uh, you know, for 42 family? years. Family. I have, I, we have two sons, okay. um, uh, both of whom initially were in music. Our older son went to Northwestern in saxophone performance, very quickly changed to biology. Uh, finally went to, to oh. medical school at Loyola Stritch and is now a, a family practice doctor here in Lafayette, um, specializes in, in geriatry. He's a geriatrician, uh, though he sees all ages. He did his fellowship in geriatrics at St. Vincent's in Indianapolis and has two, uh, is married, has two, we have two grandsons, Simon and, and William, five and two. And our younger son, Chris, is in Boston. Uh, he was a percussionist, uh, went to Oberlin in in the conservatory, but also gave up music. He has a recording studio in his basement, but he does um, computer support work for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the executive branch, uh, the governor's office and the executive branch. He does their computer support. Does he support. like it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think he, um, it's a lot of the same thing over and over. Um, when you work for the state, he, they're unionized. He's not a political appointee, and he's always worked for both Republicans and Democrats, and uh, they're not terribly well paid. Uh, the benefits are, are, are good, but um, uh, not a lot of variety, I think, in what. And a lot of problem, you know, a lot of problem solving. Especially when there's a change of administration. Change of administrations, <coughs> and you bring in these new people who are not, uh, well, I'm not computer savvy at all, and a lot of people who aren't. And so he does a lot of. Um, Hand holding and, you know. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, he's done, actually been the 
when uh, Jane Swift was governor, he was actually her computer person and um, uh, you know had a little office right in the state house, and he still goes over there sometimes. Sure. Under, but uh, does a lot of other things with the executive branch. Right. But it's it's. Um, uh, I think he'd like to get into. Uh, you, you just can't change jobs now. There's no oh, mobility right, right now. There's no mobility right. really. Anything that I forgot? Uh, any um, part that I forgot, or I'll let you wrap uh, it up. I don't think so. I mean, I think you've done a pretty good job of what covering things. What about post Purdue? Well, I mean, I I'm retired. I I. Um, uh, and any traveling or even well, we do. We've always done a little traveling. We've we've done quite a bit of European traveling. We like to we like to vacation in large cities because we're here in this small sure. town, and right. so we're we're moviegoers, museum goers. Um, uh, we we uh, you know do some do some traveling. We we try to get away a couple times. Well, we go to Boston uh, sure. a few times a year, of course, and we'll always enjoy that. Um, go to New York occasionally. Um, Go to Europe occasionally. Um, uh, I do a lot of walking, uh, uh, you know, and, a, lot, and a lot of different things to do. Yeah, a lot of different things, and and volunteer work. I mean, I've I've um, I'm on the board of the art museum locally. Um, uh, I read. I I updated the the hundred year history of the museum for them. Um, uh, right now, we're doing a new strategic plan for them, so I've done those kinds of things. Um, and my wife does volunteer work as well, extensive volunteer work, more than I do, in fact. That's cool. Um, so we, we, you know, we'll always probably have a home here because, our, as I say, our, our older son is here. Sure. Uh, with, and that's with our grand, With our grandchildren. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, that's good. Thank yeah. you, Tom. Okay, very thank much. you very much. Um,